Who is your favorite filmmaker? For a film buff, it's usually an easy question to answer. For the casual cinephile, it might be David Lynch or Wes Anderson. For the pensive yet intelligent cinephile, it might be Ingmar Bergman or Andrei Tarkovsky. For the godlike yet slightly weird cinephile, it might be Wojciech Has or Shuji Teriyama. For me, my favorite filmmaker is Nobuhiko Obayashi. I'm not sure what kind of cinephile that makes me. Maybe a weird one. Either way, Obayashi is criminally underrated. And the main purpose of this video is to expose his mainly untouched filmography to more cinephiles. If you clicked on this video, you must be a pretty niche cinema explorer. So before we begin, click that subscribe button. Let's go. Now for some background information. Nobuhiku Obayashi was born on the 9th of January 1938 in the city of Onomichi, which is located in the Hiroshima prefecture of Japan. He was raised by his grandparents during the Second World War. Many of his neighbors died, and the whole war left a lasting impact. During the 1960s, he started to create experimental cinema. His short films were surreal, avant-garde, and often kinetic. The filmmaking feels like a rush of excitement with a nostalgic aura. During the rest of the 1960s and 1970s, he directed around 3,000 television commercials, the most famous being the Charles Bronson Mandan commercial. Most of these commercials are either lost or difficult to find because there's no way to really know if Nobuhiko Obayashi had directed them. Like, they don't have credits, so it, they're, they're very difficult to find. In 1977, he directed House. Then 43 years pass. Last year, on the 10th of April 2020, he died of lung cancer. News that still saddens me to this day. Let's talk about those 43 years. In the 43 years between Haosu and his death, Obayashi made 45 movies. These movies can be split into three groups. Firstly, there's the earlier, more immature yet camp movies, roughly from 1977 to 1983. Then there's the mostly mature, somewhat acclaimed period from 1983 to 1998. Finally, there's the latter over-sentimental movies, shot on digital and roughly released from the year 1999 onwards. On top of those three stages to his career, there are themes and author trademarks to look out for throughout his whole filmography. First of all is his anti-war, pro-peace stance that is present in many of his movies. Many of the actors and actresses appear in multiple movies. Something unique is that it is common for female characters to be the protagonist. Most of the time, they are strong female characters. When I say strong, I don't mean feminist strong, I mean authentic. There's sometimes added weirdness to his movies, which I can't explain, but I love it. Lastly, his hometown of Onomichi is often the backdrop and is portrayed very nostalgically. There's actually one last distinct thing about his movies that I can't describe. It's the Obayashi charm. When you see an Obayashi film, it feels like a Nobuyashi film. It feels warm and fuzzy, and it makes you want to smile. Yes, I am a diehard cinephile who is passionate about the most artistic, abstract films from around the world. Yet, I am a fool for any 1980s or 1990s Nobuhiku Obayashi flick. And I guess that is why I have seen 20 of them. Sure. They're not all perfect, but 
I tend to smile throughout their individual viewing experiences regardless. As I talk about each of the movies in chronological order, I'll give each a rating out of 100, and for 10 of these movies, I will give a masterpiece badge. So when you try and focus on watching his movies, you should focus on watching these ones specifically. Before I start, I will recommend all viewers purchase the Nobuhiku Obayashi Anti-War Trilogy Blu-ray box from Third Window Films. To get Obayashi movies to buy is a very rare thing, so you should take this opportunity. Now, let's begin. I guess I should start with Haosu, or House from 1977. There's a hundred reviews online, and even PewDiePie says it's his favourite film. Nevertheless, I will quickly talk about it. So, seven schoolgirls go to an old house in the country. The aunt looks after them, and maybe she eats them, like a cannibal witch. Like, it's weird. After they arrive, everything gets a little crazy. There's a head in the well, and... There's a killer piano as well. Maybe the house itself is alive and demonic. Gradually, the seven schoolgirls disappear. It is incomprehensible zaniness mixed with the unsettling vibe and obayashi charm to create an entirely odd and unique viewing experience. There's two remarkable and unusual aspects to house I would like to mention. The first is how the atomic bomb is hidden subliminally in the film. The flash of the cat's eyes and the destruction that follows. Most who watch the film don't realize how ingrained the atomic bomb is in the film, but I find it fascinating. The second aspect is how upbeat the film appears. Everyone is joyful, despite the dire situations they are in. A character might gently laugh, smile... Then look up at the sky as the music passionately climaxes in the background. House is a peculiar oddity and a bona fide masterpiece. So of course, House gets a masterpiece badge with a score of 93 out of 100. I've seen it at least five times. It's truly superb. But surprisingly, it's not Obayashi's best film. Let's move on. After House comes Blackjack, aka The Visitor in the Eye, also from 1977. The film follows the story of a young girl who, after a tennis accident, has her eye replaced by a doctor called Blackjack. Through her new eye, she can see a mysterious man. The script is based on a manga by Osamu Tezuka. However, as a movie adaptation, it is average. There is the occasional cool sets or musical arrangements. Seeing Joe Shishido from Branded to Kill as the bizarrely cool Blackjack is welcoming and pretty cool. On the other hand, his wife being a child is just weird. Everyone in the film just accepts it, like it's some weird personality trait and quirky. But, bruh, he's married to a freaking kid. Maybe she's got that Benjamin Button disease, but I doubt it. Anyway, this film is his second worst film, with a score of 55 out of 100. I would say avoid it. His next film was... Take Me Away, a.k.a. Furi Mukeba Ai, in 1978, which I have not seen. It seems like a run-of-the-mill rom-com set in San Francisco and Tokyo. But afterwards, he directed The Adventures of Kozu Kindeichi, a comical detective film starring Japan's most famous detective, Kozu Kindeichi. I have seen this movie. 
I have also seen four of Konishikawa's Inugami family movies, so I am very aware of the detective. The films had Kindeichi solving murders, usually involving 20, 30 characters, inheritance, and murder. Not only were they masterfully directed, they were also excellent mysteries that were impossible to guess the culprit. When approaching the Obayashi film, I felt like I was in the best position to understand the movie. Yet, after watching the film, I didn't understand it at all. The Obayashi film is a parody of Kindeichi, as opposed to an installment. Not only this, the plot is random. There is mystery and there is plot, but it goes wherever. What is more important is bombarding and overloading the audience with random craziness. So it's a fun film, and it kind of works. There are some cool sets and some funny moments, but it's not a masterpiece. I'll give it a 68 out of 100. There's a funny moment where the inspector sees an attractive girl and says, A rose is sweeter than you. And the girl says, uh, you got it the wrong way. So I don't know, I laughed at that. In 1981, Obayashi released his first School Girl Saves the Universe film called School in the Crosshairs, a.k.a. The Aimed School. The film follows school girl Mitamura Yuka as she deals with school life and comes to terms with her psychic powers. Very cool. Soon, another psychic girl, who's also fascist, appears and things get weirdly sci-fi. The ordinary banality of Japanese 80s high school life is mixed with the extraordinary and intergalactic stakes. The sci-fi parts are very cheesy and brought to life with an abundance of special effects in addition to this campy villain guy. You can't get more campy than when he proclaims, I am the universe. Uh, I would give this a 78 out of 100. It's enjoyable, cheesy, and the special effects are timeless. The payoff at the bonkers climax is absolutely worth it, but the journey to get there can be overly dark and plodding. In 1982, Exchange Students was released. The other titles of this film are... I am you, you are me, or Tenkosai. Kazuo and Kazumi are ninth grade students in the town of Onomichi. They fall at the base of a temple. Their bodies are switched, and they must continue high school life while coming to terms with their new bodies. The film has a lot of comedy while maintaining charm and maturity. The film is a comedic drama, in the way that the funny moments are from the situations and the characters themselves. For example, the boy, with a girl's conscious, tells the girl, with the boy's conscious, how to use tampons. This is very funny. There's another scene where the girl beats up all the guys. This is very funny. It's authentic hilarity. What's most surprising would be the maturity the film delivers, especially near the finale. The whole film is a mix of maturity and immaturity, fun and seriousness, comedy and drama. It works so damn well. I'll give this film an 85 out of 100, and I would also give it a masterpiece medal. Make sure you check this one out. I mean, it's so much better than... Kimi no Nawa. Like, there's no one in that film called Kimi. And even in the in the title, they're like, nah, <laughs> and wah. Like, is, it, they're admitting in the name of the film that it's like, nah, don't watch it. And wah, it's, it's just, it'll just make you cry. So like, yeah, this is so much better. In 1983, Obayashi released his other High School Girl Saves the Universe film called The Little Girl Who Conquered Time. A.K.A. 
The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. And yes, it is based on the same novel as the 2006 anime movie. Kazuko is a high school student living out her school life. One day, a chemical spill at the laboratory of the school gives her the ability to travel through time. Meanwhile, mysterious happenings are occurring, revolving around a boy that she has known for her whole life. This film, also set in Onomichi, feels very quaint and nostalgic. The cherry blossoms flow from the trees. They sing a lovely song in a greenhouse, and the peaceful streets are historical and picturesque. But then plot. Plot, lots of plot. I would say too much plot. It's not that big of a deal, because... You have a delicate soundtrack that climaxes constantly. It's cheesy, but I love it. You have acting that most would consider amateur, but I would consider iconic. Then you have the special effects, which are experimental and very 80s. This film brings together a lot of the best aspects of Obayashi and the 1980s era to create one of his most iconic films. Also, the time travelling during the climax needs to be seen. This gets a Masterpiece medal, with a score of 88 out of 100. I think it's a great achievement, and just generally enjoyable. Unfortunately, I have to stop here. I hope you enjoyed this overview of early Obayashi. The films we looked at today were from his early, more entertaining and immature period, transfer students being the odd one out. The comical zaniness in Blackjack and The Adventures of Kozu Kindeichi progressed into the 80s nostalgia of The Aimed School and The Little Girl Who Conquered Time, planting seeds for what is to come. In two weeks or so, I'll review Obayashi's best period of work from 1984 to 1998. We will start with the overly dramatic Four Sisters, progress through many films including the excellently terrible The Drifting Classroom, before finishing on the award-winning Sada, which I'll be honest I still haven't seen, Um, I, I need to catch up on a few films, but please subscribe for this and other pondering videos. I'll see you in the next video, goodbye.